I am the uh, moderator. My name is Will Sean. I'm from Pacific Northwest National Laboratory in the U.S. Um, and I'm the moderator for panel one, uh, which will be addressing various aspects of uh, offshore wind modeling opportunities and challenges. Um, and Larry, I think you need to stop sharing your screen so that oh. I can share mine. <clears throat> so that uh, you know, we'll begin with a keynote speech, uh, a keynote address that is, um, let me see if I can get my. Yeah, I think I shopped screen. sharing, Will. Yeah, I, I, you have now, I think. I'm not getting. Oh, okay. Yeah. Very good. Bring this up. Um, I can do this. So do I need to swap my uh, display? No, it looks good, Will. Okay. Um, so um, the panel this morning then is, uh, uh, and, and I will not go through individual introductions for each of the six speakers um, because uh, we have left zero time for the moder moderator to make remarks. Uh, but we will have uh, Shali or, or Charlotte and Shali uh, sharing a keynote address uh, for 25 minutes and we'll have five minutes for discussion after that. And then uh, we will proceed through the remaining four speakers um, who will each have 10 minutes. Uh, we, depending on how the time goes, I may be able to take a, quest, a single question uh, off chat at the end of their talks, but we would like to, as much as we can, preserve the 10 minutes allocated for discussion at the end. So the idea, is that this panel will set the table for, for some discussions that occur uh, in the breakout later. And uh, with that, um, I would like to uh, turn this over to uh, Charlotte and Shali. And uh, you may introduce yourselves further as you like, and then share with us what uh, you have to say. So thank you. I'm Xiaoli, also from DTU. To follow up um, Charlotte's presentation, I will focus on offshore missile scale modeling, uh, particularly on resource and uh, extreme uh, extremes. Um, so yeah, over the oceans, we would like to harvest uh, the richest wind resource, but we also want to avoid the damages to our turbines and to our working crews. Um, so when we have, you know, the wind farms growing over the, you know, the world's oceans, modeling is a powerful tool um, to help us to assess both the wind and wave conditions. And there are challenges in, in modeling and the, both winds and waves, um, depending on what the, you know, the particular uh, purpose of the wind, offshore wind activities are. And to, to give a, a few examples, for instance, resource, sighting, design, extremes, forecasting, operational maintenance, and the challenges are different for different uh, activities. So if we uh, now focus on the resource, you just heard uh, the, uh, uh, what Charlotte ex explained, um, you know, currently in a, in a calculation of offshore wind resource on a missile scale, uh, scale, you don't see wind farms there and either their impacts on, uh, on each other. And also you miss some details which can be put into words like accuracy. Uh, of physical processes on different scales. Um, yeah, we talked about the coastal flows yesterday and um, you know the farm wakes versus turbine wakes. And those wakes are there uh, very real as Charlotte also showed in, in her slides. And here is another example showing, you know, um, you know the wakes can be tens of tens of kilometers long in, in the favorable stable conditions. There are communities now working on modeling these farm wakes. Uh, and DTU is also among um, them. And here's an example of our modeling system. Here is wind wave coupled modeling using uh, EW, EWP uh, scheme that's developed at DTU showing, you know, these wakes we can actually capture 
uh, them. And if we zoom in here uh, to these two wind farms, you might have seen this um, simulation of this wind farm wakes um, corresponding to the satellite picture showing here. And that is from our colleague, Patrick Walker, who developed this explicit wind, um, um, wake parameterization um, as in addition to the, uh, the fit parameterization that's uh, publicly implemented in WOLF. Well, as you might feel that it's not a standard procedure to include the, uh, you know, the farm wakes into our um, calculation for wind resource assessment, uh, but there is, uh, is this kind of direction uh, toward that. And DTU is making an effort in that direction. And here you can see our wind wave and wake uh, coupled modeling system which can be applied to you know, existing farms or farms in the future, up to your imagination. And then they will provide uh, the winds that we can put into a power balancing modeling uh, system to assess the impacts uh, of the wind farms on the power um, system. So, That's for the resource part. And now we come to the extreme parts and I'm quite excited about talking about this because the challenges here are quite different from the challenges for the resource assessment. And uh, yeah, we saw the summary that in general, we just do not have this ability in capturing a lot of the extreme events. And uh, you know, the, the uh, interactions between wind and wave and the ocean during those extreme offshore conditions. We do not understand uh, what is going on and we don't have measurements for building up the understanding of the physical process during these conditions. And this embarrass <laughs> embarrassing situation can be summarized in this picture. And this is, you know, for you who have worked with air sea interaction, this is a drag coefficient and this is wind speed. It's very uh, useful uh, relation to be used for um, wave modeling and atmospheric modeling. Here you can see the collection of measurements. Most of them are collected over open ocean, um, open ocean uh, conditions, and not in the coastal. That is what he's saying, and or in the wave tank. But for the high wind conditions here. The measurements are from a few hurricane uh, cases. And in the modeling, really it's up to your imagination which way to go because we do not know what's going on and what to choose is. So our DTU's effort um, in capture, well, well, in um, modeling extremes are targeted at, we want to capture the storms for both wind and waves. Uh, at the same time, we want to capture the key statistics of extremes if we cannot solve, uh, resolve the physics completely. So we did make a, we did make an effort in that direction by um, working on the wind and a wave coupled modeling uh, using the coaster system that's there. But our contribution um, to the existing uh, coupling approaches is, was to implement the wave boundary layer model inside the SWAN through momentum conservation and kinetic energy conservation um, so that uh, the effort in the wave modeling um, that takes into account of the shallow water effect, the shoaling effect, the, the, uh, the <clears throat> wave breaking processes that can be transferred through the, uh, the flux and directly be transferred to the atmospheric modeling. And we have simulated uh, southern storms uh, of the North Sea over Denmark and indeed show um, the improvement of the extreme wind here, the 50 year uh, wind speed at measurement height. Com this comparison shows that, you know, the improvement is there, but we still, you know, missing the extremes is still um, underestimated. Um, so, well, how, how far can we go with mesoscale modeling? Well, there is a general uh, problem with 
mesoscale model in capturing um, those extremes. Um, yeah, because we, we know, well, for, for people who have worked with mesoscale modeling, they know that we, we, uh, we use um, smoothing approaches to enable uh, numerical stability. In the end, you know, the, the resolved resolution is lower than the uh, special resolution that a mesoscale model is expected to provide us uh, the variability in the flow um, up to, you know, the, the expected for instance, 10 minutes or a couple of kilometer resolution. Here is an example to show this, uh, this study was from a few years back. So back then the <laughs> mesoscale model is quite limited in capturing high uh, spatial resolution, but even the model were um, set up at two, uh, two kilometer resolution, they're still missing the variability in the mesoscale. And uh, why does it matter for extremes? Yes. Just using a, uh, a simple uh, approach for the Gaussian process uh, for random time series, that we can we can calculate the impact of this missing variability at this frequency if we want to get um, the corresponding resolution of extremes because it's proportional to the second order spectral moment. So that means if we directly use the model time series, we'll get underestimated extremes. So in our study, we just put in, you know, this missing variability. If we have a measurement, if not, we have a spectral model um, to, to replace uh, the, the variability in this range from a, a mesoscale model time series. And so that we can get a, you know, a corrected time series and calculate the extreme winds. And this simple idea has been applied to um, a reanalysis data uh, to make the, the extreme wind, the here the 50 year wind at uh, uh, a number of heights over the globe. And here is an example of a uh, 50 year wind at 100 meter over the ocean's globe. Um, yeah, I just want to point, we also made a, you know, a similar calculation over land at a resolution of 200 meter, 250 meter resolution. Um, this simple approach, of course, has its limitations for areas, for instance, tropical cyclone areas. And there we also applied a machine learning process based on best track data and corrected on top of the, uh, the spectral correction method. So um, to sum up, um, we, we need uh, developing, collecting, and using measurements with good targets. Uh, more efficiently to, to help us to understand the, the physics, uh, physical processes better. And when the physical um, uh, or the dynamic modeling is limited, we will have to use stati statistical approaches to help us to, to make the application uh, for offshore modeling. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Charlotte and, and Xiaoli. Um, we have a few minutes uh, for questions. I had uh, uh, just sent a chat out saying that since there are about 120 people on the call uh, or on, in the meeting, that um, if uh, you could use the chat uh, to ask questions, that would be great. Um, are there any questions for Xiaoli or Charlotte? Well, while people are thinking, um, you know, I, I did have a question or two. Uh, the, the first one that I had um, for, uh, is for Charlotta, um, and that regards the SAR winds. Um, you know, since you don't know, um, if I understood you correctly, the um, stability correction to apply when you're using SAR um, because it's simply measuring the, the sea surface. Um, have there been, uh, or, or is there an algorithm or a, a processing uh, component that provides any kind of uh, un indicating uh, indicator of uncertainty for SAR winds? I, I've not actually looked into that for a long time. So um, I was wondering if, if there are uncertainty estimates that could go with that. Well, 
the, the sound winds uh, we produce from a backscatter uh, using a model and a, a geophysical model function. And you can say that there are uncertainties related to this geophysical model function. So, and there are many uh, model functions to choose. Uh, so yes, we have uh, estimated and many other researchers have estimated these uncertainties on the SAR winds themselves. What I have not seen so much is, um, and, and well, and I could say it's in the order of one <laughs> meter per second, roughly, but it's, it, it's not an accurate number. <clears throat> Hmm. And but but the second maybe other part of this question is how to find out what is the stability over the ocean? How well do we know it? And uh, how well can we compare the, the method we are using when we extrapolate the winds from 10 meter to 100 meter? We have had a few met masts where we could compare in the North Sea and Baltic Sea where there were sonics and temperature measurements and, and all of that. So it was possible. Uh, but it would be very interesting if if it became possible as well in, in other ocean like Atlantic Ocean. Um, so if measurements are available at platforms, yeah, that that's what I have to say because it it is usually not measured uh, yeah. much. Yeah, well, I, I was just thinking that if um, if you know one were providing SAR data to say wind plant developers the, the, or, or other users of the data, that if there could somehow be an estimate of the uncertainty that was just an inherent part of the, the data delivery, um, I can imagine several scenarios in which that would be very welcome and valuable. Um, okay. And that would of course include the uncertainty around not knowing what the stability is uh, as well. Yes. Um, so we have a, uh, uh, thank you. So we have a question from um, uh, Peter Sullivan. Do you see a correlation between SAR winds and sea surface temperature? Oh, yes. Well, we didn't investigate that uh, too much here, but we did it for part of the European waters. And yes, uh, and as well as ocean currents. Well, in this case, the Gulf, the warm Gulf current coming up. Uh, and we can see some biases in the wind speeds when you have these features. I know the Japanese uh, looked at a cold current, Kuroshira or something, where some of the same happened with opposite signs. So yes, indeed, yes. Um, we have a question from Daniel Kirk Davidoff. Um, it looked like the model results had too little variability over the US uh, continental shelf, very consistent around seven and a half meters per second. Um, so this would be for Shaoli, I think. Uh, any thoughts on uh, what sources of spatial variability are being missed? Okay, um, so that's that's Shaloda's slides there. Um, well, we, I, well, yeah, the coastal process, the the wolf simulation are normally quite smooth. Um, compared to SAR uh, satellite data, because there are just episodes, uh, not, well, how many, how many slides were there? I can't remember. Um, yeah. Uh, that probably, yeah, I, I actually do not know. That's the simulation, no, that's a simulation from uh, uh, Enrio. Was that at uh, three kilometer resolution? And you, yeah. Well, it, it is a wind tool kit from NREL, basically the WARF model. Maybe yeah. Caroline is online and can support yes. yeah. this knowledge. <clears throat> yeah, I can see, well, Andrea asked the question, how are their simulations done? And too short, uh, too short, that's for sure. Probably because, I mean, there are just uh, corresponding slides, you know, the time, uh, snapshots to the to the SAR data, right? And um, yeah, the the SAR has a resolution of 500 meter. Let's just be specific on that. And the the wolf has a resolution of uh, four kilometers in this case, if I remember correct. And the and the effective resolution is like seven times of that is 28. So 
So it's no wonder it's a lot smoother than the SAR data uh, because of the resolution is there. Well, thank you. Um, I think we should move on um, and uh, we're, we're doing a good job of keeping to schedule so far um, to uh, Branko Kosovic, who will be uh, talking about um, uh, data and mesoscale modeling. Hello, um, thank you, Bill. Uh, and I'll focus today on both more US and also more uh, what our project is doing with respect to me uh, mesoscale modeling um, for mesoscale to microscale coupling and uh, uh, parametrization development. So, <clears throat> so already talked about uh, how at atmosphere is all uh, connected and we really have uh, global scale affecting synoptic mesoscale all the way down to fine scales and dissipation. And the uh, spectrum, energy spectrum is continuous. So really we have to account for that when we are targeting meso to micro coupling that uh, all the atmospheric scale affect uh, the finer scales. And for that uh, purpose, we need codes that can do this transfer of energy from large scales to small scales we need to have uh, proper boundary conditions when we are coupling mesoscale to microscale, uh, turbulence <laughs> development on microscale that three-dimensional turbulence development has to be accounted for. And we'll hear talks about that. I'll focus here more on parametrizations, um, PBL parametrization and surface layer parametrization. And here, in addition to all this transfer in atmosphere, we also have to account for the ocean effects, the effects of waves and ocean circulations. So when we talk about uh, offshore environment, while uh, it can be considered more homogeneous, it really, we have to be careful uh, because we have uh, effects of land, uh, land and sea interface, uh, sea breezes, land breezes, while uh, development of uh, wind plants can be far offshore. Um, the effects of sea and land breezes still have to be captured accurately in, in mesoscale simulations in order to get even the further offshore uh, um, wind flow correct, correctly. We have to account for wind and wave coupling. And that also depends on the depth, um, ocean depth. Um, and the question there is also whether we have to um, couple mesoscale moss with bay moss, with ocean moss, or with both, unlikely with both. Uh, for example, um, when uh, we have a deeper ocean like an, in California, uh, in the coastal region where we have a, a coastal jet because of the topography, uh, we can get this uh, upwelling that can affect surface temperature and that it can affect uh, atmospheric circulation. So it's all um, connected and has to be accounted for. Of course, on the East Coast, we have a Gulf, Gulf current and uh, that, that um, interacts with shelf current in the North. And this, this uh, creates a significant temperature um, gradient that affects also atmospheric circulations. Uh, finally, um, we have tropical cyclones that sometimes that definitely affect uh, in southern uh, Atlantic, but uh, occasionally they also propagate all the way to the north. And this was uh, um, Sandy, uh, Storm Sandy that hit New York um, pretty hard. So I talked about uh, Gulf current and shelf current. And uh, one thing that's uh, interesting here is that uh, very often offshore conditions uh, are considered to be uh, near neutral. Uh, and really when you look at uh, some observations in Europe at Fino Towers, uh, the uh, majority of cases are near neutral. They're not necessarily neutral, but near neutral. However, in, on the East Coast, uh, we have uh, uh, the condition is particularly in summer um, when shelf current is uh, very cold and, um, and we have uh, flow from the west or northwest 
going of the, the shock current and a stable boundary layer develops. And within stable boundary layer, we have development of low level jet, just like in Midwest. And that low level jet um, is uh, and stable boundary layer is often very shallow, low level jet very strong. Uh, here we have example from the CBLAST experiment of a couple of days. Um, low level jets are reaching uh, 30 meters per second. These are composite uh, plots uh, from observations with um, light, um, ultralight aircraft. And uh, on the second day, uh, the, the wind uh, uh, is dying down, but low boundary layer is becoming even shallower and the jet is at uh, very low levels. Um, that also points out the importance of uh, profile measurements because measurement at 10 meters would give us completely a wrong picture about what happens to the hub height. Uh, similar conditions, uh, so these conditions can persist for days in summer um, over Atlantic. Uh, similar conditions were observed uh, in CBLAS 2003, uh, the first uh, uh, plots were from 2001. And uh, from 2004, LIDAR observations, uh, ship-borne LIDAR observations, show frequency of that uh, low level jet that really occurs quite often and at quite um, at relatively uh, low levels, half height levels. Uh, so this was a stable boundary layer that develops uh, in summer over Atlantic. We have uh, different conditions that can develop uh, in winter where we have cold air outbreaks that um, uh, are essentially a result of what's sometimes called uh, uh, polar vortex. The cold air from polar areas uh, comes down and then flows over warm ocean. And here we develop convective uh, circulations. First is helical convective rolls that then turn into convective cells. And uh, we have two satellite images from more the satellite uh, near uh, New York. Um, Similar conditions can occur over uh, Great Lakes, uh, where also a wind deployment uh, is planned. Um, uh, and the, the, the challenge with these, um, oops, sorry, the challenge with these uh, simulating these connecting conditions in mesoscale simulations, as uh, Sue already uh, pointed out, is capturing the structure of these convective uh, motions. And here we have example of one called the outbreak. This is more in polar regions near St. Matthew's Island. On the left, we have a satellite image and uh, these uh, convective uh, helical rolls are first very um, relatively small, they grow and they transition to uh, cells. If we do warp simulation, there, there is really no widening of convective rolls and transition is not captured. So that's why high resolution and different parameterizations are needed. And this was also motivation to develop 3D uh, PBL parameterization that we uh, developed uh, based on the W52 project where we are parameterizing the full uh, turbulence stress uh, and uh, its diversions following Melville Armada developments. And uh, <clears throat> this, uh, Closure is, uh, um, we have a consistent closure assumptions, the uh, no assumptions of horizontal homogeneity. To demonstrate uh, the importance of capturing uh, horizontal uh, stresses and, and, and uh, gradients, we uh, carried out a larger dissimulation of a W5 domain at 100 kilometer. Uh, domain size, 180 kilometer domain size and 30 meter resolution, and then filtered that uh, LES simulations at different scales, uh, starting from three kilometers down to a uh, few hundred kilometers, a few from 3,000 meters to down to a few hundred meters, and uh, computed um, the ratio of horizontal shear to vertical shear. And we can see that as the filter size decreases, the importance of horizontal shear increases and reaches 25% at about 100 meters. But already at, um, 
at uh, 1500 meters, we have more than 5% um, of uh, horizontal shear is more five, than 5% 5 of vertical shear. And that also contributes to uh, turbulence. So it's, uh, it, it becomes important to account for it. Uh, in order to uh, carry out um, measures to microcoupling, since uh, um, we don't have as many observations on the, in the US, so we really initially focused on the observations at Fino Towers and carried out some uh, mesoscale simulations that uh, will be used to couple them with microscale simulations. We focused on Fino 1 tower um, in, in 2010 year, where we also uh, know that uh, the, the Alpha Ventus wind plant was deployed and we can uh, use also uh, uh, observations from uh, Alpha Ventus for this purpose. We uh, carried out a sensitivity study varying various parameters as listed here, different PBL schemes, uh, different treatment of surface roughness and uh, uh, surface uh, temperature. And uh, uh, using, uh, carrying out this uh, sensitivity study, we try to assess um, the skill of uh, different uh, simulations. And they all uh, show pretty good correlation with observations, uh, more than 0.7 in general. Uh, this is the Taylor diagram, diagram that summarizes uh, this in a graphic way. But it, it shows also importance of uh, I, um, accounting for sea surface temperature as well as possible. So moving on um, to um, observations, I said that uh, in the US, um, we really do, well, there are a number of observations. We, for, for the purpose of my, to microcoupling, uh, we need really good observations, um, in situ observations of uh, surface fluxes, as well as profiles, as well as sea state. And that's really hard to find uh, in, in the US. Uh, NOAA has a network of buoys that provides a, a sea state and uh, wind speeds uh, near the surface. Um, DOE uh, now has uh, a couple of LIDAR buoys and they have been deployed in experiments and those data will be using. Uh, to my knowledge that there are, have been two towers, one is ACID tower still uh, um, there at near Woods Hall and the other was Cape Wind that was operational from 2003 to 2011. The challenge with um, uh, observing fluxes uh, near, near um, offshore is reaching uh, close enough to the surface. Uh, for example, Fino Towers uh, first levels are at uh, 30 or more meters, uh, 40 meters above the surface. Um, now, uh, flux observations from buoys have been compared to acid tower and there's a pretty good agreement. So that's, that's a possibility to use uh, um, flux measurements from buoys. Um, we have uh, been working, um, I think Sue mentioned that and there'll be another talk about applying machine learning for surface layer parameterizations uh, in offshore conditions. Again, for that purpose, we use uh, observations from Fino tower. And here I show on the top uh, two panels a comparison uh, of uh, Mono Bukov on the right to uh, machine learning uh, um, prediction of uh, surface friction velocity. We see that uh, machine learning can significantly reduce mean absolute error. The same goes for temperature scale, um, significantly lower uh, error. And you can also notice that uh, the peak uh, here in uh, um, density of uh, prediction is at uh, positive um, temperature scales, meaning that uh, considering that U star is always uh, positive, uh, there are more conditions where we have connect convective conditions. And more in the book of that underestimates that. Um, 
so you'll hear more about how machine learning model was developed onshore and then uh, applied offshore. But important is here to mention that we are not using this as black box, but we are really using all the tools that machine learning provides to assess what are the important predictors and, and uh, uh, draw physical conclusions from that. And these are finally some uh, uh, final thoughts um, that I'll just leave up here in just stress importance of collecting more data for development and validation. Great. Thank you, Branko. Okay, great. I'm Matt Churchfield. Um, I'm a senior researcher at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Um, I work on wind plant aerodynamics using high fidelity modeling and I I lead NREL's part of the meso microscale coupling project that all these labs work on. Um, my background is aerodynamics and I've learned meteorology, well, atmospheric boundary layer meteorology kind of on the fly as I came into this job and it's been great. I've loved working about it, learning about it and working on where engineering and atmospheric boundary layer meet up. So I'm gonna talk about the microscale modeling part. Um, and I, I started by thinking about what does microscale modeling mean for me? And, and I think a lot of people, when we talk about it at workshops like this, LES comes to mind first, but really we shouldn't, we shouldn't jump to that conclusion because it can be many things. I think um, other people have, have pointed this out well earlier. Um, it can be brands, it can be linearized flow models, plus some engineering wake models. Um, what do you use it for in wind energy? Well, there's, we've seen a lot of talks about very localized wind resource assessment, um, but there's other things um, that we definitely need to, I think Andreas said it well, it's holistic. Um, we can use the high fidelity part for wake physics discovery to inform engineering models. Um, you can use it as an advanced control or operational systems virtual laboratory. Like if I think about what the control science group at NREL or other places like TU Delft does, they use high fidelity microscale modeling to try out new controls ideas um, or um, you could really think about just simulating a whole plant and its interaction with the grid, you could probably do that by tying to the microscale model. Understanding mechanical loads. So what is the role of mesomicrocoupling in this? Well, you can really vastly increase the range of conditions that, that you can represent in the microscale beyond the canonical. So what's different about offshore microscale modeling? Well, coupling with waves, becomes really important because the waves modify the flow in the vicinity of the turbines. Um, the wind modifies the, the waves. And then there's this question of how do, how do waves and the way they modify the flow affect the wakes? Um, that, I don't think that's been very explored. And then there's all sorts of different atmospheric phenomena that have been brought up in the previous talks like land, sea breezes, coastal low level jets, tropical cyclones, that you need to take into account. Um, there's a, a need for good characterization of the sea surface temperature because the winds above are coupled with that. And then question that I, I have is what effect does moisture have on the flow? Um, and I'll, I'll get to why that question comes up in a minute. And then as Andreas just showed, the wind turbines of the farms may be floating. So now you've got a very complex machine or system of machines being subject to the wind and the waves. So what he said about it being holistic, I think I, I really agree with that. All of this needs to be considered together to really understand how these systems work and respond to the wind and the waves. Um, so I just put these in to kind of show the, the complexity of offshore wind. <clears throat> the left picture is, is the Block Island wind farm. It's the first US offshore wind farm. And those are in big jacket structures. They're big 
six megawatt turbines on jacket structures. And then on right, on the right is Highwind, is one of the Highwind Scotland turbines that Andreas just talked about, where it's on a floater. There it's being towed out from the fjords to where they are off the shore of Scotland. So now even more complex because you've got six degrees of freedom. And then the sizes are just becoming amazing. Um, you know, we're talking about the, the idea of 20 megawatt turbines is not out of reason now. Um, on the right is General Electric's Haliad 12 megawatt turbine. And you start thinking about 220 meter rotor diameters and um, start thinking about some of the lower frequency turbulent structures coming through the rotor and it, it, turbulence modeling and understanding how that impacts these turbines especially if they're floating, um, becomes so, so important. And you only get that through the microscale. Um, okay, so what does high fidelity wind energy microscale modeling look like at NREL? Um, this is a picture in my head. Um, so it, it, beyond, it, it goes beyond resource assessment. Um, we need a microscale solver that blends the atmospheric and the engineering world. So although, you know, wharf to wharf LES is a really great tool because all the meso micro coupling is there in one solver. We don't always use that. Um, we will couple something like wharf with a CFD model because we need to do simulations with the turbines where we we model those as anything ranging from actuator disks to geometry resolved, flexible rotating rotors where you need a complex CFD sort of mesh. Um, that's like that picture shown on the left. And then you can do things like simulate an entire wind plant and look at not only individual wakes, but the whole wake of the plant. Or maybe you do just look at individual wakes and try to better understand their, their behavior um, and maybe you have field measurements and you augment field measurements with simulations. And then that hopefully all boils down to informing better wake models. Um, this, this animation, I just, I want you to imagine being a big 12 megawatt turbine. The, your rotor diameter is traced out by that red circle. And this is the flow field you might see. So imagine your blades flying around through all these turbulent structures, through the shear of the atmospheric boundary layer. Maybe you have a coastal low level jet that's got a really low nose and you're flying through that. The loads get really complex. So, um, you know, I, I argue that microscale modeling, high fidelity microscale modeling can be used to inform low, low fidelity microscale modeling um, and turbulence models so that we can better understand loads and, and just um, responsive turbines to this complex turbulent environment specific for the offshore. So just some kind of conclusions in my mind and here's an animation of a, of a wake that comes out of high fidelity microscale modeling, just to kind of show that they're really complex. Um, I'm, not in, I, I'm not advocating, and I, I, I really want this to be clear in a workshop like this, that industry needs to adopt hi-fi microscale models for wind, term, wind turbine wind farm design. Um, if industry sees the need for that, great. But I think that you know it, it's not something that you you design wind farms with. But please do remember that now faster than real time LES is available, and that high end GPUs are like a small supercomputer, and those are available now. So we can use high fidelity microscale modeling as a discovery tool to improve lightweight tools. Um, Andreas showed a an animation from a tool called Fast Farm, which is really pretty neat because it's a, a mid-fidelity tool that runs on a modest number of CPUs. 
yet you can get a lot of the unsteadiness that you would get out of LES for a very small fraction of the cost. Um, and that's a good example of a tool where high fidelity modeling was used to design that tool. I think long time series are becoming increasingly important. So rather than looking at a series of 10 minute samples of turbine response to turbulence, I'm, I'm feeling like site specific multi-day simulations could yield information that, that perhaps we didn't consider before. Um, I think we've reached a time where we can incorporate observational data into microscale simulations. Um, I know that's already done in mesoscale and probably some in microscale, but we can start bringing that even into LES to make the LES follow reality more if, if that's necessary. My personal top picks for the use of high fidelity mi microscale for offshore wind energy modeling are um, you know, understanding the adequacy of design standards for design standard turbulence models and improving them if required. It's not really my idea. Others have talked about that a lot, but I think we really need to do that. Um, we, we still rely on surface stress and flux models that were kind of designed for onshore and we just use them offshore. But why can't wave resolving simulations be used to design better surface shear stress models for offshore so that you don't have to do wavy bottom simulations and you can still get results that reflect what happens over waves. We can use it for, gener for creating next generation wake models. Um, new issues, keep, we keep talking about things like wind farm blockage or farm induced atmospheric gravity waves and their impact on the farm. Let's use it for that to understand those so that we can then boil it down and put it into faster models. And then an interesting one is planning field campaigns. Like if you're gonna use LIDAR, where do you place them most effectively and efficiently? What will they see? You can simulate that beforehand to try to get an idea of what your experiment might yield or modify your experiment. Okay, that's, that's all I have. Thank you. Thanks so much, Matt. That was uh, really interesting. Uh, so if you can stop sharing your screen and then uh, Peter, if you'd like to go ahead and uh, uh, start driving, that would be great. Okay, well, just a second. Okay. Uh, well, is it good? Um, you need to get into presentation mode, I think. We're seeing the, uh, the whole set of your slides. There you go. Perfect. Okay, thanks. Um, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Hope you're doing well, enjoying coffee if you're in Europe. Uh, I changed the title of my talk just a little bit. Uh, I was just gonna give some brief ideas about coupling uh, marine boundary layers to the ocean surface. Um, a lot of the things I do are sponsored by uh, ONR. ONR, this is a long classic problem for ONR. They've conducted modeling, et cetera, observations over a very long period of time. Okay. Uh, I work at NCAR, NCAR sponsored by the National Science Foundation. Um, Bronco went over this slide kind of quick, but uh, it's, it's really a nice depiction of all the physical processes that happen close to the water. Okay. Um, this was part of an ONR field campaign called Sea Blast. Sea Blast was very much focused on examining how the air and the water talk to each other. Um, there's beautiful processes, language circulations in the water. There's wave breaking, sea spray, evaporation, uh, internal waves in the water. And part of the objective of Sea Blast was, well, how do all these small scale things work? Uh, this is really a broadband problem. Like I wrote down here, sea spray. This is millimeters, bubbles and spray. Okay, you might have hundred meter swell all the way up to tens of kilometers of surface heterogeneity. So no supercomputer in the world is gonna do all that. Okay, but 
the wealth of processes is really great. If you're keen on the topic or you're just modestly interested, I listed some interesting reviews of different processes that happen here. Jim Edson wrote one on C Blast. This is an air sea gas exchange. Uh, Jim and I wrote something on winds, waves, and currents in annual review. Eric DeSaro, uh, he's talked about ocean turbulence. Fabrice looked at ocean spray. And this is still very much a topic that's at the forefront of geophysical research. Okay. We've learned a lot over time, and one of the things is the classic picture is that uh, the atmosphere drives the ocean. That's very much true if you're talking about big scales, but air-sea interaction ends up being very scale dependent. As you go down from the biggest scales, and eventually you get to the mesoscale and below, lo and behold, what happens is the water drives the atmosphere. This is shown quite readily in SAR and other kinds of measurements. If you even hop below the classic mesoscale, you'll see something that's called submesoscale. Super popular topic in oceanography. It create, it's really a turbulent soup. There's fronts, uh, vortices, uh, just a whole cadre of turbulent motions. Um, this is simulations from ROMs. SST might look like something. You get a little filament here. Well, here's a beautiful picture of plankton patterns in the Arabian Sea. And you can see all the submesoscale turbulence that exists at the top of the water. Uh, here's some clouds right here. So the whole question is, is where the culture is going is you want to think about this in the context of this. It's this holistic view that what's the impact of all this sub-mesoscale stuff on the atmospheric boundary? Complex couple problem. Okay, uh, there's a couple wharf roms models that exist of this with 1D parameterizations. You can find them in the literature or you can ping me and I can tell you where to find them. I'm simply gonna talk about two problems in a lightweight way, uh, just a little bit of detail. Uh, these are LAS examples of one-way coupling with an ocean surface. These are supercomputer calculations, uh, 10 to the ninth points. In my modest opinion, supercomputers are underutilized to look at this kinds of phenomena. The first one is just uh, surface waves. We're going to put surface-fitted time-varying grid, and we're going to impose a time-varying spectrum of waves and watch what happens. Here's just a snapshot of what the lumpy surface looks like. Um, the other problem I'm just going to lightly discuss, this is a brand new one, is heterogeneous SST. So imagine, if you will, here's Z, here's X. I'm going to put surface temperature here. And then downstream, I'm going to make the temperature be either hotter or colder over a surface, over a distance L. Okay, so in this particular example, uh, the geostrophic wind is this way, and it's a real simple just science question. What happens downstream of this? Well, this is a really neat problem, okay? Um, I adopted a Fourier fringe te technique to control the inflow and outflow turbulence. So the turbulence that comes in here is going to be fully developed, fully developed boundary layer turbulence is going to evolve through the box and then it's gonna hop out. The real trick, uh, if you ping me, I'm gonna run, I run two LES concurrently, one in a small box to get the boundary conditions for this and one in a big box that has the heterogeneity. Okay. All right, uh, perhaps you've seen this, but we'll talk about it. Good friend of mine, young guy, he made this really cool movie of some simulations that uh, we've uh, developed over time. Uh, the movie is self-contained, and so you can just watch.
Okay, uh, so that was a really neat example of LES capability and the coupling between different scales of motion. Here's just an instantaneous slice. Uh, the wind's blowing at you, and you see these tall towers. These are shear convective rolls. Here's the wave fee surface at the bottom. Complex flow. LES can do this really neat problem, and you learn a lot of interesting things. OK, uh, the second example is a brand new one uh, that I briefly alluded to. It's the spatially evolving boundary layer downstream of a warm SSD front. OK, so if you look at the cartoon on the right, here's X, here's Z. This part of the water is warm. And this part of the water to the right of this white line is warmer. It's theta plus 2K. What I've shown here. Uh, because this is a wind energy application, I took the far wind upstream, averaged a ton. Then I took at each slice x, I took the wind, I averaged it, and I subtract it from each other. So we're looking at the change in the mean wind speed downstream uh, from this temperature front. Well, what you see is really neat. You see a growing internal boundary layer, goes like this. The water surface, uh, the wind speeds speed up fast. Notice it speeds up at the surface faster than it decreases at the top of the boundary layer. Decreases, the boundary layer grows. Okay, so you see this particular change in the wind speed over this particular range. This is very different if you change it from theta to minus, if it actually gets colder. Uh, some of the interesting things that we learned here, uh, the vertical fluxes, they're very nonlinear in Z at each one of these locations. That's a usual assumption when you build a PBL model. Uh, really surprising, you end up with overshoots in the scale in the scalar momentum fluxes. Uh, a really neat result was uh, we see an intermediate maximum in the W variance. The maximum W variance is right here not at the end of the box. Surprise, surprise. It takes an enormous distance for the boundary layer to reach equilibrium. Uh, OK, so we always think about boundary layers as this composite mix of mean winds, turbulence, et cetera. But when you have heterogeneity like this, you generate secondary circulations. And they can play a very important role. Uh, the secondary circulations are very much a function of the orientation of the wind relative to the surface heterogeneity. Just for fun, on the bottom left here, uh, this is just an xy slice. Okay, we're looking at vertical velocity at 41 meters above the water. Uh, this is where the SST jump is right at the surface. So you, you can see there's really not one of the one of the aspects of the fringe technique we developed. You generate real turbulence. It's not synthetic turbulence. If I just play it. It's kind of neat to watch what happens to those convective lines. The W is very positive, so there's a bias towards convection up with interspersed with down, down drafts in between. And you see this really neat spatial evolution of the vertical velocity field. If we looked higher up, this line where it starts to really feel the surface would be way over here on the right. OK. OK, this is actually my last slide. And uh, I thought I would just put down some thoughts about computational challenges for simulating turbulent winds with LES. Here's a real sea surface, OK, out in the middle of the ocean off the coast of California. This is what we'd really like to know. OK, this complexity, beautiful complexity. We'd really, at least I would, I would like to know how this works. OK. so. In order to understand the winds at 100 meters, you really need to understand the surface drag. There's teleconnections. There's the drag of the water surface. There's the winds at 100 meters. They're connected. So in order to understand the winds at hub height, you need to understand what the drag is. Well, that raises really interesting question. OK, you see all these beautiful surface waves. So a nice science question is, what scales support the wind stress as U varies? If you talk to someone who studies this problem in great detail, okay, you can argue, well, where does the drag of the water come from? Where does the drag on the atmosphere come from? Is it these really big breakers right here that are intermittent, these big scars? 
Or is it these little small guys, these microbrackers that just turn the water a little bit white? Well, it ends up that these little guys are really important for creating drag. So, but it's very much a function of the wind speed as to what part of the wave spectrum actually carries the drag. There's a whole host of really interesting fluid mechanics and how this works. Critical errors, flow separation. People argue about whether there's flow separation over all those waves. Non-separated sheltering, are the waves just steep enough to shift the pressure field? Breaking, you can obviously see breaking contributes to, to this whole thing. If you're gonna do LES with resolved waves, you have to ask a very important question. Am I gonna use statistical waves, measured wave field? Imagine you had a, just a snapshot or snapshots of the wave height that you could put at the bottom of a code. Am I going to use phase resolved waves? Phase, I mean, you actually track each wave as it goes along. This broaches a really neat idea of nonlinear wave models. How do you couple dynamic surface with the atmosphere? You have to use this. It's certainly algorithmic complexity in doing that. Okay. So one of the important ideas is non-equilibrium. Imagine you have a storm way over here. The winds are really, really, really high, okay? It's going to generate a big wave field. Those waves don't dissipate. They propagate over here, and maybe the winds are light. So then it's remotely generated swell, wave age. The winds and the local waves are not in equilibrium. Very important problem. It happens all the time over the ocean, okay? So this brings up the notion of winds and waves, misalignment. You still have to be able to do unstable to stable stratification. You want to have day and night. So finally, coupling. I showed a little example of heterogeneous SST. It ends up that the currents are really important in doing this. Okay, So if you're going to view this holistic view of how boundary layer is hooked to the water, you have to think about this. Then there's finite depth water that changes the whole physical process. Finally, Ocean boundary layers plus sub-mesoscale turbulence. It's one scale up in terms of complexity, but you want to think about that. So the thing is, you guys want to be practical, and maybe you just say, that's too complicated. I don't want all that detail. This is where the science field lives, OK? But maybe you just want to use a flat surface with measured drag. This is the conventional way of doing this problem. So over here, I plotted CD as a function of U10. Okay, these are measurements that Jim Edson made from the sea blast tower. And so this is the torque core representation along this line. So you see this neat dependence of CD on U10. But you notice in a really interesting way that if you come out here as the winds go higher and higher, the scatter decreases. What happens is then the winds drive the local waves and you end up with wind wave equilibrium. Much better, much better agreement. But as you back off, all this variability of the wave field starts to pop out. And so then at this particular regime, you end up with a lot of scatter. Okay. Uh, down here, just another typical parameterization. Mark Donlin tried to weave in CD as a function of U10, but including variations in wave age and significant wave height, et cetera. One of the things is to collect this much data to build these correlations is truly daunting, okay? It's really hard to nail this down, okay? So but that, that's kind of where it is. If you want to have variability, understand the physical processes, you're over here. If you want to do practical calculations, you're almost forced to doing a flat surface with measured drag. Um, okay, well, I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Peter, and uh, thanks to all of the speakers in this session.